Welcome to Beverly Unitarian Church Online Worship. I'm the Reverend David Schwartz, minister here at Beverly Unitarian, and it is a pleasure to be with you in our online worship service this morning. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation. We're a community of children and youth and adults. We're a people of many races and many religions. We're a people of many genders and sexual orientations and abilities and educations and life experiences and traditions. And instead of minimizing that, instead of discarding that, we lift that up, we celebrate that. We say, yes, that is who we are and what we're about. All of you is sacred. All of you is welcome here. Whatever your past was like and whatever this present moment is like, the invitation is to journey into the future together with us. And that's not just for the newcomer, although newcomer, you specifically are invited to journey. That's for all of us too, long time members and recent members. It's a continual recommitment to travel together. Like other Unitarian Universalist congregations, we affirm seven principles, not doctrine or dogma, not a bullet point list of the things that we believe, but an indication, a pointing toward the values, the commitments, the ethic that we share in common together. Today, I am delighted that ministerial intern Julia Jones will be leading our service and preaching. It's been a pleasure working with her through the fall and now into the winter, and I'm glad that you'll have the opportunity to hear from her again today. We especially welcome visitors, and I hope you'll stay for our virtual coffee hour after the service on Zoom. Uh, use the link, it'll be shared at the very end of the service. We remain physically distanced, but we also remain connected. If you're a Facebook person, check out not just the church Facebook page, but you can also join the private group for conversation, community, and connection among ourselves. Contact the office to sign up for the weekly email. Contact the office to sign up for the monthly newsletter. Or reach out to me. I'm always happy to be in conversation and connection. And now, I invite you to join together in beginning by taking a breath. and settling, and centering, and stilling yourself, and preparing your heart and mind for worship. God bless the grass that crawls through the crack. They roll the concrete over it and try to hold it back. Concrete gets tired of what it has to do. And after a while, the grass breaks through. And God bless the grass. God bless the truth. It fights toward the sun. They roll the lies over it and think that it is done. Moves through the ground and reaches toward the air. And after a while, it's growing everywhere. And God bless the grass. God bless the grass that grows through cement. It's green and it's tender, it's easily bent. Up its head, cause the grass is living and the stork is dead. And God bless the grass. God bless the grass, it's gentle and low, its roots are deep, its will is to grow. And God bless the truth. Friend of the poor and the wild grass growing at the poor man's door. And God bless the grass. 
It is January 31st, 2021. Already we're advancing into the second month of this new year and as usual, I am still writing and referring to the last year in most things. My mind is still on yesterday, but I am here with you. It is Sunday, the fifth Sunday that has happened this year and tomorrow will be February. My mind is still on yesterday, but I am here with you. This past week, my spring semester began. Impossibly, my fourth semester of potentially six, if all goes well. My mind is still on last term, but I am here with you. Social distancing creates distortions in time. Working from our homes and in ways that include less interaction smooths down the variation that helps us know what's next and what's important. My mind is muddled and needs prompting sometimes, but I am here with you. I want to welcome February, but if I'm being honest, my welcome is enhanced by February's brevity because February, particularly this February, can be brutal. It's not you, it's not just you. And still, we can be here together, even in February. Kay Montgomery of the Church of the Larger Fellowship shares these words about February. February is not for the faint hearted, I think. It is so exceedingly ordinary, having neither the romance of spring nor the bravado of winter. And the ordinary is tough, it seems to me, demanding as it does not only endurance, but imagination. We gather on this late winter morning in a village of faith, warmed by those who join us, saying to one another by our presence here that together we find comfort and even hope in the gray days of February, in the dailiness of our lives. We have noted the light of the late afternoons and the odd and out of sequence melting day. Join in meditation, in praise of simple stamina and with faith in renewal. Take a deep breath, friends, and let it out. Exhaling 2020 exhaling January and exhaling the resignation that can come with so many gray skies. Breathe in again and exhale the boredom and exhale the heartache. Exhale the weariness. Exhale the disorientation of days stringing together so we can be here together. Join me in welcoming possibility or at least considering its arrival. Join me in noticing the growing light even as it is reflected in the gray clouds and the less than pristine snow cover. Join me in praise of simple stamina and for a reimagining of what winter can bring with the light of learning and the flame of our chalice. Join me in our chalice lighting words, dear friends. We light this chalice in deep respect for the mystery and holiness of life, in wonder and gratitude for those who have gone before, with love and compassion for those who dwell among us, and with hope and faith for the generations to come. Friends, will you join me in the words of our covenant? Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another.
is the same sound as the blood in your body as it moves across your bones. Are you listening? Are you listening? Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Cause the sound of the river as it moves across the stones. Cause the sound of the river as it moves across the stones. Is the same sound as the blood in your body as it moves across your bones. Is, is the same sound as the blood in your body as it moves across your bones. Cause the sound of the river. Cause the sound of the river as it moves across the stones. As it moves across the stones Is the same sound as the blood in your body As it moves across your bones Is the same sound as the blood in your body As it moves across your bones Are you listening? Are you listening? Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Does the sound of the river as it moves across the stones is the same sound as the blood in your body as it moves across your bones. Are you listening? Are you listening? Put your roots down. Put your roots down. Hi friends, it is really good to see you. It is currently, while I'm taping this, um, Wednesday. So we still have a fair amount of snow on the ground. And I got to wondering about what's under there. Because even though we haven't had this much snow most of the winter, we've had a covering for a while and I'm not from here, so I don't know what's going on under there. So I thought I would take a look. Why don't you come with me? This is my back door, by the way. Um, yeah, so we're going to head out on a, on a brief expedition, and I'm going to look for a little life under the snow. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to try not to go too fast because I know that can be jarring headed out into the backyard. This is uh, this is where we feed the birds. We've gotten a little silly about it. You can see there are several feeders there <laughs> and some movement. There's also, going real slow, over here, there's our bucket feeder. That's where we put food for the squirrel, Frank, because if we don't give him a separate feeder, he eats all of the bird seed. We find that if we give him his own food, he will leave some for the birds. And that way, we are all happy. Over here is a remnant from our snow person from the first slightly larger than nothing snowfall and a perfectly good implement 
what's under here. Now, I do have dogs, so this could go very badly. I don't know if you can see this. Did some digging. My dogs are gonna be very irritated that I've disturbed the scene. At any rate, it's still there. The grass is still there. And it's green even. Even under all of that ice and snow, it is green and alive. That's kind of amazing to me. That's just amazing to me that the grass is staying alive under ice on top of it. There's some other grass over here, different kind of grass that we uh, call ornamental grass because it's so lovely. I don't know what kind it is. Um, at home we had some like it that was called pampas grass. I don't know if this is the same, but you see it's much taller and it's really quite strong. It's really quite strong. I'm, I'm not pulling too hard because I don't want to actually hurt it, but I'm giving, I'm actually, I'm giving a pretty good tug and it's not going anywhere. It is just not going anywhere. Now I'm giving a serious tug and friends, I am unusually strong. Nothing, nothing, really tough. Even though it looks for all the world to see, like it's kind of lovely, but you know, dead. There we go. I heard a story the other day about bridges. What? I heard a story about bridges that were built in parts of South America. That's my neighbor's dog. At any rate, a group of people who lived in South America called the Inca used to use grass in a very interesting way. This really tall, long, sturdy grass, probably sturdier and longer than what I was just pulling on. And they would harvest it, cut it at just the right time, gather it, collect it, dry it, and then they would stretch it all out and then they would braid it. And then they would take those braids and use the braids to make things like bridges. <laughs> so not even just things like baskets, they made bridges that went across gaps between one hillside and another hillside, like big bridges to carry people. And the thing about it is that in making these bridges, it wasn't just one person decided, okay, I'm going to make a bridge and, and took on this monumental task. It was that they did it as a community. And the community didn't even say, okay, together we're going to gather this and then we're going to do this and da 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 they each contributed to a small piece of it. So some people would help to watch the grass as it was growing, and some would watch for exactly the right time to harvest. A few would harvest it. The next group would dry it and stretch it out so that it would be easy to work with. The next group would make the braids and then the braids would go to the next group who would maybe braid the braids into even bigger braids. And then the next group would be the folks who took the braids to the site. And then the next group would be the folks who would start to make the rails for the bridge. They each did a small part. They each did a small part with their grass to build bridges to other people. Just one little thing. And that's how it is with building bridges. 
that's how it is connecting to other people, particularly to people that we don't know. Maybe live in the community next door or who maybe go to a different school or maybe who are friends of your friends, but you don't really know all that well. You can build a bridge. You can always build a bridge. You don't have to do the whole thing by yourself. But if you just start by doing one little thing, one little thing, maybe it's as small as a wave on a cold day with a warm mitten. Maybe it's as small as a nod in the hallway when we're back to the hallway. Maybe while we're learning from home and working from home, it's as small as a text message or asking a grown up in your house to send a note for you. You can build the bridges so that we can all be together one little step at a time. I'm gonna go inside before Quincy starts barking again, but I'm so glad that I got to be outside with you today. And someday we'll get to be outside together in person. It won't be long, no matter how it feels today. <laughs> Bye friends. In the 1993 movie Groundhog Day, Bill Murray plays a television newsman who, while reporting the annual visit to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania for the famed groundhog's take on the length of winter, finds himself trapped in a seemingly endless loop of experiencing that same day over and over and over and over again. Once he discerns the pattern, Bill Murray's character, unsubtly named Phil, wonders aloud why this is the day he must repeat. I was in the Virgin Islands once, I met a girl. We ate lobsters and drank pina coladas, Phil exclaims. Why couldn't I get that day over and over? I have some sympathy for Phil. Even as I sit here, knowing that my family's current circumstances are shielded by privilege and luck, quite frankly, I just as soon not have this pandemic winter continue for one minute longer. I too would like to choose a different day to repeat, preferably one with considerably more sunshine and some human contact with anyone outside of my immediate family. But alas, it is January 31st. And while Groundhog Day might be two days away, I have a feeling that I can give you the forecast. In a fit of frustration, Bill Murray's Phil responds to the tradition of rodent-driven meteorology this way. It's going to be cold, it's going to be dark, and it's going to last you for the rest of your lives. While my weariness of our current situation can put me in a dark place, I also feel confident that it will not last for the rest of our lives. Winter is, after all, a season. And I would suggest that it is a season that is widely misunderstood, even here, where we usually get such a good long taste of it. Today, I want to examine some of our stories about winter and the lessons for us that continue despite the ice and snow. And my mission in choosing this topic is not just to have a moment to complain about winter because I'm aware that our first Illinois winter has been pretty gentle, but to have a moment to breathe into this moment that is ripe for imagining different ways of seeing, thinking, and being. I think it is clear that we are, as a nation, ready for newness, to change our commonly held life, our society, we must be able to see things differently, to think about them differently. In other words, to change who we are as individuals so that we can build something better than what we have. 
And so I pray for that openness of mind and heart today. The spirit of life that surrounds us and draws us together as we allow Lead us today into the stories we tell, the beliefs we hold, and the visions that we carry into the future. Let us learn the flexibility to see the variety that lies before us as the space that is to be navigated rather than a multiple choice test awaiting our error. Let us see with new eyes, hear with fresh ears, and love with open hearts in the days to come. Friends, we have so much to share. We have so much learning to do together and so much caring to provide for one another. In the moments that come, please feel free to share your cares, your joys, your concerns, even the tiny victories that may make today or tomorrow feel like something really good. Remember that our chat is public, and if you would prefer that we light a candle for you, in your quiet concerns of your heart, simply type I, I as though you're raising two fingers in person. Let us help hold you and let us celebrate together. read Walden, Henry David Thoreau's memoir of life in a cabin on Walden Pond in ninth grade. While I confess that the lengthy discussions of the price of nails were perhaps wasted on my 14-year-old self, I did appreciate the notion that a simpler life can be both achievable and fulfilling, even to town folk, of whom Henry David Thoreau was most assuredly one. 
part of the continued appeal of Walden and the transcendentalist movement of which it was a part lies in its call to greater connection to the natural world. Thoreau tells us to live in each season as it passes, breathe the air, drink the drink, taste the fruit, and resign yourself to the influence of the earth. Thoreau's advice is easily taken, at least in summer when there is an abundance of fruit to taste, but the fruit of winter is a bit more scarce, even in a relatively mild winter such as the one we're having now. As a mid-Atlantic transplant to the region, I'd like to tell you that there's an appeal to following at least some of the influence of the earth where winter is concerned. I really understand the call to find a cave and curl up like a bear to hibernate, even sporadically, until stronger sun returns. If we were to follow Thoreau's advice, we might be more like those bears, or like chipmunks in their tunnels, fish at the bottom of a lake, or even the wood frog. The wood frog that essentially freezes for winter. Ice crystals in the blood freezes. It's not just animals though. The seeds of much of the food that we eat sit and wait, frozen until the right moment presents itself. This is a familiar story about winter. We feel it in our bones, this loss of light and the colder temperatures. This story about winter is one that assures us that it's natural to withdraw and slow down, perhaps almost to a complete stop. Very importantly, the duration of that slowing is limited and it is a thing to be endured, to be gotten through. We will wait it out with ice crystals in our blood if necessary and count the days until the growing of the light is noticeable. This old story about winter comes with lessons about rest and introspection. It is a story that reassures us that things will get better naturally when the time is right. There's some value there to be sure. Thoreau's botanically based optimism begins at its foundations. He says, I have great faith in a seed. Convince me that you have a seed there and I am prepared to expect wonders. Thoreau required only the presence of a seed to be certain that the rest would be taken care of. It can be hard to trust in that inevitability, even in the mild January that we are experiencing. But tomorrow, dear friends, is the first day of February. And Massachusetts raised Thoreau assures us that true winter is reserved only for January. In his journal of February, 1854, he specifies, is not January alone pure winter? December belongs to the fall. It's a wintry November, February to the spring. It is a snowy March. Tomorrow, dear friends, begins our snowy March. As evening arrives, it will also be the feast day for St. Bridget of Ireland. Candlemas, which commemorates the first presentation of the baby Jesus in the temple, and Imbolc, the pagan celebration of the midpoint between winter solstice and spring equinox. The name Imbolc is believed to come from Old Irish and meant in the belly, in reference to the early pregnancy of ewes, by which I mean expecting sheep, not ewes as in you all in Pittsburgh. Imbolc celebrates the earliest awakening of nature, those first stirrings of spring that you seriously cannot see outside, when it is still cold, but the days are getting longer. Images that celebrate this holiday feature a woman, some say St. Bridget, in the earth below a tree, gently waking from slumber. This is the time of year that, 
when I had a garden, I would suddenly remember that seed starting is a thing and look up the dates for planting indoors. In bulk is about preparation and making way, tending to possibility and laying the foundations for an abundant future. In bulk teaches us that the world is not a place of binaries. We are not one moment asleep and the next fully awake. We are not all good or all bad. It is not all dark or all light in the sky, at least not in most places. And even if we follow the patterns of the earth, as Thoreau suggests, there is a vast territory between dormant or sprouting. The natural world is an ongoing process, one that embodies and demonstrates change for us and as such daily reveals gradations between every extreme. In bulk reminds us to notice the shifts, the transitions. It celebrates both the awakening of the visible natural world and gives heed to the temporary nature of any state. It will change. May we always greet those changes with respect and celebration. The lesson of the Imbolc story is one of greater nuance, of recognizing our capacity to hold contradiction and still be hopeful. We can acknowledge that things are neither one nor the other, but are often, as so many of us are now fond of saying, both and. Imbolc also urges us to prepare to make way for the new as a way of honoring liminal time and space. This story that Imbolc tells, despite its greater nuance, still relies on that notion of dormancy and growth standing in opposition. The funny thing is that nature contradicts all of that. Last weekend, at the urging of my science-minded sister, I watched the documentary Fantastic Fungi on Amazon Prime. Only a sister could encourage me to watch something called Fantastic Fungi on Amazon Prime. And what this film made very clear to me, and further research after the movie confirmed, is that this dormancy and sprouting story no matter which phase we look at, only takes a relatively small part of the world of plant life into account. Those seeds that we are waiting on to sprout and create a visual, visual and nutritional feast for us only hint at the botanical reality that exists just beneath our gaze. Modern science offers us a new story of winter and really of life here on earth. And that new story is created by different ways of measuring, of seeing, and of understanding. Underground, where that seed of the old winter story lies waiting, fungi, bacteria, and all kinds of microorganisms are extremely active converting life forms into food, breaking down dead matter, even building massive communication and nutritional networks. Matthew Wallenstein, Associate Professor of Ecosystem Science and Sustainability at Colorado State University, has spent many years researching the microbes, bacteria, fungi, and other soil organisms that continue on with their normal processes underneath permafrost. By measuring the amount of carbon dioxide, Wallenstein can measure, essentially, their breathing. He says, we can see that they're actually transforming that soil and making nutrients available so that when the plants start coming to life in the spring, there's actually nutrients available for them. Another researcher referred to fungi this way. They are at the end and at the beginning. The omega and the alpha of the forest. 
They break down dead trees, leaves, anything else really that sits still and change its very form. Fungi are miraculous. Mycelium are the vegetative part of the fungus. They are under the ground. They are in the soil and they branch like threads. You've seen them on moldy bread or a rotten tomato and have likely even seen them in the soil without necessarily knowing what you're looking at. These mycelium are essentially long threads that grow in every direction and work through electrical impulse. Mycelium, the plural mycelia, word nerd moment, is the largest organism on earth. Yes, I just told you that the things that grow on moldy bread are the largest organism on earth. There are 300 miles of mycelium under every footstep in a forest. Fancy that. So not just the largest, but huge. Mycelium connect other organisms. Trees communicate and share nutrients using mycelium as the passageway. In this way, parent trees actually nourish their genetic offspring across long distances. Species that partner with mycelium are least harmed historically by extinction events. These thready organisms that are neither plant nor animal create an interlocking, intersecting matrix that create a community that both survives and flourishes. When we dig into the earth, oh, so gently, to discover what else is going on besides the final product of what we desire above the surface, we discover there are millions of processes occurring at a rate that could hardly be classified as any kind of dormancy. We learn that it is the unseen and previously unmeasured work of a significant part of the ecosystem that makes this old story of relative dormancy and sprouting possible. What these winter workers do beneath the level of our casual gaze is quite literally transformative. It is life-changing and life-giving. Extending the metaphor to ourselves, to our own communities in this time of need can feel like a mammoth task. However, it is exactly this kind of thinking that social justice facilitator and author Adrienne Marie Brown asks us to undertake in her work, Emergent Strategy. Brown asks that we look to successful systems in the natural world to plan for a community that is more inclusive, that is more responsive to the inevitability of change, that teaches us through the modeling of ants, ferns, starlings, dandelions, and yes, you guessed it, mycelium. How would we mimic this vast and amazing species that is neither plant nor animal? The answer is simple, perhaps not easy, but simple. And it is one that many of you already know so well. We mimic some of the most successful life that nature supports through connection, through extension, through our distribution of resources and selective decomposition. If we follow the example of those winter workers of the earth, we must ask ourselves, what can we save of our habits our interactions, our communities, and our systems that will continue to nourish us? How can we learn and be fed by what lies in the past? What can we build cell by cell, beginning with our own internal understandings that we might all be and feel the benefit of our connectivity? 
how can we signal for help, mutual aid, and abundance through the networks that exist and that we will now create. For these, if Thoreau is right that we should follow the patterns of the natural world, these are the conditions that allow us to flourish. These are the conditions that create the spring and all of the beauty and deliciousness that it brings. We nourish ourselves with what has passed. We strive for openness and connectivity. We communicate, we share, we help, and when it is time, we rest. And here in the audacity of what Brown suggests, it is tempting to turn away from the metaphor because creating such a society would be, in total, a mammoth task. But here's the thing to remember. Mycelium grow one cell at a time. The connections are as thin as fine thread. Those slim connections built one cell at a time can turn death into life, can turn decay into nourishment, can turn isolation into supported single life, and can turn coexistence into interdependent, inclusive, loving community. One cell at a time. We can get through the rest of this historic pandemic winter. We can get through it if we can define we as broadly as possible. If we can connect with each other and then keep building cell by cell until our interconnections are so great that they create fertile soil for new life, for our collective new life. One cell, one call, one story, one shared moment, even one more blessed Zoom meeting at a time. One moment seeing the work that makes our own lives possible. One moment being the quiet laborer for another's benefit. One moment being the wise one and one moment the beginner one moment the beginning and one the end, and one moment between all of the opposites and eithers and evers and nevermores. It is not complicated, this revolution of interdependence and thriving when taken one moment, one choice, one cell being built at a time. Just one at a time until our efforts bind us in an intersecting, interlocking matrix of constant endings and beginnings, continually learning from our mistakes and preserving the good to nourish the new, digesting destruction and nurturing a society that smells so strongly of earth and life that it can only fool us into thinking that rebirth is possible. That is what awaits one cell at a time. May it be so. <laughs> Thank you.
as we make way for the days to come, we do so with faith in the fact that sometime, sometime in the next several weeks, we'll receive a sign from the skies and the ground to reassure us that no matter our reduced participation, some life always continues. As we prepare to re-enter our communities, we do so with care and humility, knowing we can never fully understand the perseverance of life and that we must often be instructed by those in most need as to how to best nurture growth and survival in hard times. The story of humanity is one that attests to the fact that we can build new things, create new life, restructure our days and our society, even when the beginning is messy and uncomfortable, ill-timed, beset by a lack of motivation, grief, anger. We can do better, be more connected and whole, and we can make it through to spring, one cell at a time. Friends, please join me in our chalice extinguishing words. We do not extinguish the flame. Each of us take a piece of it with us. Let us carry this common fire until we meet again. Until next time, my friends, be connected and be well. If you're able, dip into that connection with us today on Zoom for coffee and conversation. Go in the peace of knowing that the days grow longer and the sun is on the way. In love. Peace be with you. Thank you.